commandment in the law is the greatest. He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. If I were to ask you, what is the most famous line to conclude many stories and fairy tales? Of course, you would say, and they lived happily ever after. Now, before those of us that are a little bit jaded and say there's no way that's real, reject that thought. I'd like to invite us to consider the reality that this phrase, happily ever after, is actually a very Christian idea. That is, it's recognizing that we're made for an eternal happiness. We are destined for an eternal happiness. And it's important to note that within these stories, rarely, if ever, would you read, and the prince, being deeply wounded by the dragon, abandoned his family and the princess and lived happily ever after. <laughs> Rather, what these stories tend to convey is two very basic but beautiful truths. The first is that good is meant to triumph over evil. The prince is meant to conquer the dragon or defeat the witch, whatever the bad thing is in the story. And of course, they're intended for union. We never hear that the person is off on their own and they live happily ever after, but they're with other people. That is, our happiness is actually included or dependent on being in communion with others. That is, we're made for love. We're made for love. And Jesus, of course, illustrates this in today's gospel as he speaks of the two greatest commandments in the law. These two commandments that sum up all that's expected of God's people. To love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you're anything like me, if we take an honest look at our lives, we'd see very quickly places that we struggle to live this out. I really want to love the Lord with my whole heart, with all that I am. There are times where I love the Lord with part of what I am, and part of me just wants some bacon. Or there are times when it comes to loving my neighbor as myself. I'd say part of me really wants to love my neighbor, but part of me is really frustrated by that annoying thing that they do. And if this is the command that the Lord says, this is the greatest commandment, everything is summed up in this. And if we see the places that we fall short of living out that reality, what hope do we have? What hope do we have? And this is where it's important to take a step back and examine what's the story in which we are participating? What's the narrative that actually defines the universe? And of course, we know if we go back to the beginning, that the beginning is a moment of love. The Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit creates us. Creates other beings to share in God's goodness and love. To share in this communion. Of course, we know that God creates Adam and Eve. He creates us male and female. And we might say, well, why does he create us male and female? That written into our very being, it recognizes that we're made for union. The male body or the female body by itself makes no sense. It's only together that they make sense. What is God speaking in this way is he's telling us very clearly, you are made for union. But of course we know that Adam and Eve, giving in to the lies of the evil one, they turn away from the Lord. They don't believe that God is actually a good father that's going to provide for them. They give in to the lie that they have to do it all on their own. They have to save themselves on their own, make themselves like God. And of course, we know that as a result of this sin, 
As a result of this disobedience, death enters the world. Division enters the world. Not just division out there, but division within our own hearts. That we see these places where, yeah, maybe I, I really want to do this good thing, but then there's also a part of my heart that really struggles to. But of course, the good news is that God does not leave us in this place. That the Father sends the Son to take on human flesh, to become one of us, to live like us in all things but sin. And of course, we know what happens as Jesus comes, that he's rejected by the Israelite people, the people he was sent to reconcile to the Father. And as a result of this rejection, he ends up crucified on a cross. He's put to death. But in a mysterious way, in this moment of failure, in this moment of defeat, this is actually the moment of great triumph and victory. That is, at this moment, God defeats the power of sin and death. And that as he raises Jesus to life, now we're invited to profess faith in him. And that it's faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the Son of God, that can bring us to eternal life. That actually gives us access to that happily ever after. That we are created for an eternal union with God. And it is in Jesus Christ that we find that. And the reality is that as we're given these commandments, as God sets out this incredibly high bar for us, he doesn't expect us to live it on our own. That this is actually meant to be a response to his first loving us. That is, if I find places in my life where I'm struggling to live well, it's a sign that I actually need to encounter the love of God in a deeper way. This is why St. John says, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he has first loved us and sent his son as expiation for our sins. That this is the incredible love that we're offered. And if we find ourselves struggling to live these things out again, it simply means we need more of his love. And the good news, my brothers and sisters, is that he is eager and ready to pour it out. That he has created us for union with himself. That he's created us to draw us into the intimacy of the Most Holy Trinity. And we encounter in, in a small way a foretaste of this union, of this love, every time we come to Mass. That every time we come to Mass, we participate in the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That in a mysterious way on this altar, we're transported back to Calvary. We're transported back to the empty tomb that we encounter the resurrected Lord who comes to us because he loves us. Who comes to us because he desires to save us, to reconcile us to himself. So as we recognize in our own hearts today, hopefully, these places of our weakness, these places of our, our brokenness, our inability to live out the command that he sets before us, let us not become discouraged. Let us not give in to despair or hopelessness. But rather, let us turn to the Lord as we encounter him today and simply ask him for more. Simply ask him for a greater encounter, a greater experience of his love for us, of his love for us in our weakness and in our brokenness. How deeply he desires to come close. How deeply he desires our hearts even in these places where we think we might be undesirable. There's no way anybody could possibly love me here. It's especially in those places that the Lord desires to love us. That he desires to come close. So this morning, let us not be afraid to simply offer everything to him, asking him for more. That as we encounter his love for us present in the most blessed sacrament, we will be given the grace and the strength to love others and to love him with all that we have.